This is, as promised, the interview with Richard Le Parmentier, the actor who played Admiral Monty, the commander of the Death Star in A New Hope, a veteran of many other films such as Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He currently works as a screenwriter for Hollywood. Richard was very open and frank with us, and he talked about his experiences on set working with George Lucas, experiences hearing about episodes 1 through 9, his opinions of the new Star Wars and the changes that were made, and so on. Hope you enjoy the show, and of course, go back to listen to the rest of the podcast, the December edition of the Retro Star Wars podcast. Um, first of all, how do I pronounce your last name so I don't butcher it? Uh, Le Parmentier. Le Parmentier. Le Parmentier? Le Parmentier. That's good. That's close enough. Okay. French name. It is indeed. Okay. I might just say Richard. That way I won't use my American accent oh, wow. to just stitch through things. <laughs> I'm assuming that happens frequently, though. Oh, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> it does. Okay. So, um, excellent. Just a little uh, brief on what Retro Star Wars is. Uh, I'm quite sure you've talked with Alex before and so on. Retro Star Wars is a Facebook community um, with almost 40,000 members now uh, where we collect like old school Star Wars photos, old school Star Wars experiences. Sometimes we have newer stuff in there because, you know, it's still around. Yeah. Um, but we, we try to collect the really old behind the scenes stuff. And so what our listeners are trying to find, we're trying to get behind the scenes stories, um, Amusing stories on what it's like to work with, you know, Lucas and so on, um, actors and characters' thoughts on set and stuff like that. Right. So that's what the questions are going to be focusing okay. on. Okay. Well, actually, there wasn't a lot that went on because it was all right. I can explain why there wasn't. Uh, but yeah, that's fine. So you got forty thousand. Uh, you got forty thousand members on this. That's that's really good. Yep. And then the retro podcast is relatively new, and then it's part of a podcast which I run as well called uh, Bombad Radio, which is about a year and a half. Right. So, uh, okay. So we'll try and get some of your people to start liking my fan page, because I'm just about filled up with friends now, and uh, I can't, uh, so I can't take any more friends on. Uh, yeah, so if you put a note on to, to go to my fan page and, 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 and give it a bit of a bump, that'd be great. Could you link me to your fan page um, in the chat? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. God, don't ask me how to do When that. we're done. When we're done, we'll do that. Uh, yeah, but it's on Facebook. It's Richard Le Parmentier, Admiral Marty. Okay, excellent. Uh, so, uh, do you have any questions for me before we start? No, no, I'm fine. I'm ready to go. Excellent. Let's get this started, then. Okay, welcome to the show, Richard. I guess the first um, little thing we're going to ask is... Uh, not since not everyone knows who you played in Star Wars, I know some of the diehard fans know, but there are lots of casual people, lots of people who are fans of Clone Wars and prequels that don't pay close enough attention to the classic ones. So why don't you introduce who you played on Star Wars, um, how much involvement you had uh, in the Star Wars franchise since then, and so on. Just a little introduction to yourself and your connection to Star Wars. Right. Well, I'm I played Admiral Marty, the uh, commander of the Death Star, in Episode Four. Uh, actually, I'm very surprised that people don't know who I am. <laughs> uh, but my, my character was really the only Imperial officer who stood up to Darth Vader. Uh, and therefore, I was the uh, first recipient of the, uh, of the Force Choke, as it's come to be known. You can say you're one of the first Imperial officers to stand up to him and live. I was the only one to stand up to him. No one else stood up to him. Everybody else, <laughs> everybody else crossed him up. <laughs> you know, you're brought on set. You're brought onto this Death Star set. I'm assuming. I'm quite sure it was filmed in London, as I recall. And you were brought in there, and you get to film this wonderful scene with Peter Cushing and David Prowse with Lucas directing. What was it like um, meeting Peter Cushing and George Lucas and working on that set? Right. Um, well, Cushing was very, uh, very taciturn guy. Uh, he, he was, I wouldn't, people would have thought that he would have been standoffish, but he was just very remote. Uh, he, his wife had died three years before, and he did tell me at one point that he was just waiting to join her. So he was, uh, he was a rather strange man. What about um, David Prowse and uh, meeting with Lucas? Well, uh, I met George before when I auditioned. 
Uh, Dave, I didn't know who Dave was. Uh, as it turned out, I'd been in a couple of movies with Dave, but he helped, but he always had a, a helmet on or extreme makeup on. So this was kind of, uh, uh, this was, he was, he was Darth Vader. I mean, he was, you know, a very nice guy from Bristol. Uh, he was incredibly hot as we all were, but he, nobody was more hot than he because the set was very, very hot. Uh, and as I said, Lucas, I had met at my audition, uh, you know, nine months before. So it was, uh, it was a very uh, tense set in a way because they had just come back from Tunisia and were pretty over budget. Uh, and scenes were being cut uh, right, left, and center. And uh, so it was, uh, it, it was, with the film being over budget, it creates a certain atmosphere. Two questions come to mind. First of all, um, what was the audition like? Like, what did he have you do to audition? And uh, what did you, what, what can you tell us of the experience? Well, I was in Los Angeles to open a film that I, I found out that I had been cut out of. Um, I was in L.A. to premiere for the premiere of Rollerball uh, and then realized no one at United Artists or the director or the producer uh, bothered to tell me that I had been cut out of the movie. Um, so I was in L.A. Uh, going to auditions, you know, two or three a day, um, doing meetings and meeting casting directors and meeting studio people. My agent called me up and said that, uh, I remember her quote to this day, uh, Lucas is doing this space western, and you need to get over to the old Bronfman Studios on Santa Monica Boulevard. Uh, you got to do a reading, and you're going to be videotaped. Uh, this was the first time that uh, they had videotaped auditions. So that was a, a first from Star Wars. Now it's from then on, it became commonplace. Every time you go to an audition now, you're videotaped. This was the first time. It was an old Sony Betamax one-inch tape with a big clunky camera. And we were shown into a room, and there was George Lucas and a casting assistant, and also sitting on the dais or on, on this, this conference room table were Francis Ford Coppola, John Milius, uh, Brian De Palma, uh, and a few other luminaries from the Rat Pack. Steven Spielberg, I think, was there. Uh, they were all poaching the auditions and sitting in with George and advising them or doing whatever. So I didn't know who, what I didn't know what George looked like, but I certainly knew what John Milius looked like and what uh, Francis Ford Coppola looked like. So it was a bit off-putting to walk in and then wham. We were seeing like four of the top directors in the country sitting in a room. Uh, but then what we did is the, the, uh, the casting director had us all read uh, the Han Greedo scene. So the casting assistant uh, sat off camera and read Greedo. And all, I read Han, as did probably 1,500 other male actors of my age in L.A. that week. How did you find out when you got cast, and what did you think of your role when you were initially given it? Uh, I turned it down when it was given to me. I went back to the U.K. The film went into turnaround several times after that. Uh, a day afterwards, Brian De Palma had me come down to uh, MGM, and he read me for Carrie, to play the high school principal, uh, for which he cast me, and then his that film went into turnaround. So after nine months in L.A. and being in a movie that I wasn't going to be in, and then another movie that I had been cast in didn't happen, I got pretty disheartened, uh, missed my girlfriend, so I came back to the U.K., and I was uh, the U.K. casting director, called my agent, and said that George and the producer, Gary, had been through some videotapes, and they uh, picked out a few actors, and they wanted to offer me a part. So they sent me a script uh, for a one-line part, which I read the script, uh, liked the script, but hated the part, so I turned it down, uh, because I didn't do one-lines. So somebody else took that role. 
And then while he was waiting to film, George cut the scene and he was sent home. And a month later, I was offered Admiral Marty, which was six pages of dialogue. And I, my character had a name, which my other character didn't. Uh, and uh, it was a good, it was a really good part. I got to dice it with the badass in the movie, with the bad guy. Didn't know what a Darth Vader looked like. Didn't know what a Death Star looked like, but it was a really good scene. So um, I, I accepted the part, and it fit in perfectly in my, in my schedule. So you've talked about several scenes that were cut. Are, can you actually talk to us about the original scene that you were cast for? Like, you said it was just one line, but what, what was in that scene that was eventually cut? Or can you talk about some of the scenes that were cut when they got back from Tunisia uh, when they were rushed because of, uh, you know, they went over budget? Well, um, I have no idea. The scene that I was offered was a, a uh, Imperial Customs officer that uh, gives Han Solo a rough time when he lands on Tatooine. So there was obviously a landing scene, and him and Chewbacca were getting off the Millennium Falcon, and they would come across me, who, or the character, the part that I was offered. Uh, I can't remember the line. I can't remember anything. Uh, but I, it was... You know, those are parts that I didn't do, really, you know. So uh, I didn't do, I don't, you know, didn't do one-line roles, you know, I still don't. So I don't know, I can't remember it. I honestly cannot remember it. I mean, I could have been Captain Kirgi, I don't know. But I don't think I was, because a friend of mine did take the role, and he never let me forget being cut from the movie. You, you, you remembered enough there that we can at least get an idea of some of the stuff that was cut. So you're, you're brought into um, you know, the sets, you're brought in to record, and you had read the script. You said you liked the script, but you didn't had no idea what all these different things were. No, did George Lucas ever uh, explain to you what a Death Star was and so on? Sorry? Did, you, know, you said you had uh, you know, confusion over you know, what a Death Star was, what a Darth Vader looked like. Did George ever take you guys aside and say, this is what this is, this is what this is, to try to get, have you guys you know, understand what the heck he's talking about? Or no, he, explained, he did explain the whole thing. Uh, uh, very much so. Uh, so he was, uh, I mean, he also, you know, he told me about the, uh, how this was uh, part of, a, of a, a saga, which he would hope would have, you know, would go on. Um, and that this was the first story, but actually the fourth story. Uh, and they were rewritten it to introduce the, the, the main characters in the storyline. So then we, yeah, so he explained, you know, he was kind of being, you know, geeky about it. He did explain, you know, the world that he was trying to create. So he told you in 19, what is it, 75, 76, that this I, would be episode four and not episode one. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. So when you were introduced um, to your character, Admiral Mahdi, what background did he give you for your character so you could get into the scene and so on? Like what, what was the information he gave you to create your scene, to create your character? Yeah, absolutely none. Uh, I, well, I got it from the uniform they gave me, uh, which, were, look, which were actually, in the first film, they were actually German uniforms from World War I. Um, that were used in a very famous film in the late 30s. And what, so once you put the uniforms on, you, we were fascists. So that was, you know, the, 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 key, the key to the character in the Empire is in the uniform. I mean, it was pretty self-explanatory what these guys were and what they were trying to do. Uh, so no, no, there was no real background. George, George always says, you know, George didn't go into backstories or anything. He, you know... <laughs> That's what Michael Stackpole and all those other guys do now. Uh, he, he had written his nine stories. Uh, so we just took the cue from, from, from what we looked like. That it was simple as that. Uh, it was quite a technical performance. Uh, we knew what was wanted. Uh, the whole thing was really quite technical. But, you know, I couldn't say it was fun uh, because, they, as I said, it was a rather tense set. So there were not a lot of jokes. It was very hot because Britain was in the middle of a drought. So it was 100 degrees outside the studios and about 98 degrees inside the studio. So we were, and those uniforms were made out of wool. So it was hot. That's it. So, uh, 
So how many takes did it take to get your, your choking right and to get that scene right? Did they have you do a one, two, three, did they, or did it take a lot of takes to get it it's the way you wanted it? It took four days to do the, took four days to do that scene. But I mean, there's a, like when he had you do, like, there's a part of that scene where, you know, he's choking you. Yeah. And so on. So someone, one of the fans wanted to know, you know, when Darth Vader's choking you, did you come up with the, you know, the way to react and so on that everyone else kind of using after that? To fall, George wanted me to fall on the floor. Uh, and I explained that I could wiggle, well, I could, I had a tick that I could use on my throat, uh, as I always tell people that, you know, some people can wiggle their ears. Uh, so I showed that to George and the cameraman, Gil Taylor, and they, he just loved it. So they reset the shot. Uh, if you look at, there's a very famous shot that I now have at conventions, a black and white archive shot of George and Gil Taylor behind the camera and the camera set up at the conference room table. That's them resetting the shot around my idea. Well, that's cool. So your idea was how the choking scene went. That's really cool. Oh, so are there any other stories behind filming that scene during the four days that like mistakes that happened? You know, amuse, like a story that would amuse fans that they might not have heard of before involving the filming of that scene. And it was really hot. I mean, you know, I mean, if we, as I said, it wasn't a fun set. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, films shouldn't be, shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't really have a lot of laughs on films. You know, I did Roger Rabbit for six months and nobody laughed on that movie, but it was a cartoon comedy. Uh, no, I would say that it was so hot that we, when we did the scene, uh, all of us, we all had our boots off. Uh, and Don Henderson and I had pulled up our, our jodhpurs, unzipped our jodhpurs, so we looked like we had Bermuda shorts on, because it was so unbearably hot. Uh, as I, you, uh, Dave was taking salt pills uh, to, in order to rehydrate, in order to stop uh, water leaving his body. That's how they treated hydration and back in the 70s, uh, because he had four layers on, six layers, I think. So we were, it was incredibly uncomfortable, without a doubt, you know, considering we were shooting on a sound stage. Uh, but we were using big old fashioned lights, old arc lights, which are incredibly hot. And they would open the doors of the studios between, sta between takes. And um, you would find that it was hotter, it was cooler inside than outside the studio. Because it was, it was nearly 100, it was 100 degrees. In, in Britain that summer, so it was pretty uncomfortable. Was uh, Peter Cushing wearing his boots that day or his uh, fuzzy slippers that he wore on well, set I, most of the time? I, he, he had a pair of slippers, uh, but I don't believe he wore them at the table. He only wore them when we were sitting in our, in our chairs, waiting. Uh, and we did wait a lot. I mean, you do, that's what you do on movies back then. You're, you're paid to wait. And drink endless cups of tea and try not to eat too many donuts and bacon rolls because uh, you'll start busting out of your uniform if you did that every day on a, on a, on a film. I had a script of my next job w with me, which I was looking at. I was playing, playing Ernest Hemingway uh, the week after on TV. So I was, uh, I was in the middle of learning lines for that and just going to the set when I was called and we would go and do the scene and George would move the camera around to different people, but you would virtually, you were, Don Henderson and I were probably in every shot in the scene, the way they had set it up, with the exception of the close-ups on Peter and Dave. So we had to do a lot, you know, so Don and I, Don and I had the most work to do in that scene, really. Uh, and I had most of the dialogue. Okay, so now here are some questions that came from listeners, um, their ideas. So some of them are going to be like somewhat random on topics. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess the first one is still basically on the same topic. Um, George Lucas used a lot of ADR with A New Hope and with you know Empire Strikes Back and so on. But you're one of the few characters that actually got to keep your actual voice. Um, do you know anything why you were able to keep your voice well, or what did you feel like when you actually learned that you kept your voice? I think the only ADR... I don't, I'm really not aware of that. Uh, everybody I know that was in it, Don and I, uh, we kept our voices. Uh, I don't know whether I usually, 
Uh, no, I didn't have that clause then. I do. Ha I do have a clause now in my contract that I'm not allowed. You're not. I'm not allowed to be revoiced. Um, but then that was my third film, so I probably didn't have that clause then. Uh, but no, I, I can't think of anybody who was revoiced, with the exception of uh, Dennis Lawson. Well, I know um, like a lot of people on Yavin base were revoiced, and a lot of people in the Cantina and so on, just because of uh, just the full-on Cockney accents for some of the actors were oh, hard to understand. Oh, be, yeah, I, that could well be. I, I know, I know they didn't, I know they didn't like Dennis's Scottish accent, so I could see that. Yeah, lots, lots of the dwarfs would have been Cockney, and all the extras would be Cockney as well. So they probably did revoice all of them. Well, I was kind of a featured role. I mean, those guys were kind of one-line extras. So, um, you know, they would have had, I did it, I asked George about doing a mid-Atlantic accent because I realized when I walked on the set, I was the only American in an imperial uniform. So I did suggest that um, would it be a good idea to, um, to actually go on and do a, a, a mid-Atlantic accent. And he said, yeah, that would be a good idea. So I did that. So, yeah, I mean, they only revoice people if, you can't, if, you, if they can't understand you or if your voice doesn't fit the character, you know, as would be a Cockney stormtrooper or a, a, a Cockney alien. Or the, the bartender in the cantina, I know is a big one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, in 77, when the film came out, what did you think of the final cut? What did you think of the film when it finally came out and you had to see everything with all the special effects completed, all the costumes well, and voice done, sound done? What was your opinion of the film when it came out? Well, I went to see it. Um, I, I was filming in France uh, when they had the cast and crew screening. So, I didn't see the film until it came out in the UK in September. So they had the cast and crew screening in June. It opened May 5th, 1977, as we all know, in the States. Uh, but then by that time, I had heard this, you know, well, a tsunami of publicity. I mean, that's the only way to describe it. And I did remember writing to a friend of mine. He said, oh, yeah, I, when I was doing the film, because he's a real big sci-fi fan, I said, yeah, I've done this film called Star Wars. I think you might like it, you know. <laughs> And suddenly, but by, from the by the fifteenth of May, it was a national a national hit. It was a phenomenon by the beginning of June, you know, and you know, then it, its legend was was building then. So, but I missed the cast and crew screening because I was filming in France. Nobody had heard of what was going on with Star Wars in France, and then I so I came back, missed it. Uh, so when it opened, we got tickets from Fox. And I took my girlfriend at the time, who's an actress, uh, and her niece and nephew, who were five and seven, and their mother, and I think her husband. So, like, we got, like, five, six tickets. And we went to see it in a 2,000-seat uh, movie theater in London. And I tell you, when that opening shot happened, that was just unbelievable. Because you could just... 2,000 people just all gasped at the same time. And I just kept thinking to myself, I'm in this movie. I couldn't believe it. So it was a real revelation. Uh, you know, and it just looked fantastic. You know, it really was. It was just brilliant. So are you ready to see yourself in 3D in A New Hope in a few years? I'm really, well, as long as they don't mess around with it, you know, as long as they just do the 3D, I would hope, and I'm sure everybody else is hoping, that uh, some reason will prevail and uh, Han will uh, shoot first in, in, the, in 3D. And a few of the other things that were, uh, you know, people were annoyed about in the special edition. You know, hopefully they're going to hopefully they're going to take the original and turn that into 3D. That'll be terrific. Well, I know as far as, because they did Phantom Menace, that's the one they've done so far. I know the only change they did for that one was made Yoda digital, which was probably for the best because he didn't fit the rest of the prequels. The yeah, puppet thing uh, I still like Yoda and, you know, the original Yoda. <laughs> but, like, the Phantom Menace Yoda, though, didn't really look very good. No, he didn't. No. No, not at all. <laughs> 
And then, uh, as far as, like, changes in A New Hope goes, let's see, when the special edition came out, I was 10. That's the first time I saw it in theaters. I remember I liked some of the changes. Like, I liked how they make the world bigger. You know, like, Mos Eisley being a lot bigger is a lot cooler. You, <laughs> know, you, see, I, uh, you see, I think Mos Eisley was, should have been kept a border town, you know, uh, and just a bit grubby and, you know, uh, you know, what, you know, what is the uh, Obi-Wan's line, you know? Uh, <laughs> A hive of scum and... Most rich of hive of scum and villainy. Exactly. Uh, and they, but on the opposite side, when they did Cloud City and Bespin in uh, at, uh, Empire. Empire, it looked fantastic. I bought all that because you wanted that to be bigger. So there is, you know, I didn't like the, whatever, the do-backs. The do-backs were not really necessary. You know, one was okay, but it was, you know, I, I don't know. The main problem was Han, of course, you know. I mean, why and I, <laughs> why Han had to defend himself, I have no idea. I know on the recent Blu-ray, they tweaked it again when Ali shoot at the same, exactly at the same time. Oh, but, well, eh. really? I haven't seen the Blu-ray. I must have a look at the Blu-ray. Yeah, on the DVD and Blu-rays, they, they tweaked it a bit, though I believe on the DVD, it looks like he dodged. They changed that for the Blu-ray, now they just shoot at the same time, and his head doesn't have that disgusting-looking twitch that they put in. Oh, yeah, well, you should see it in slow motion, because I was getting some uh, frame grabs from the uh, beta edition for uh, for Paul Blake, and uh, they, it was it looked awful, I tell you. When you slow it up, you know, it just was really not, you know, you could just see that it was done not very well. You know, it, it, yeah, it was just not good, you know. As far as the special edition goes, that's something fans will argue back and forth for a while. It's kind of good that we can argue it, but there's some people that like it, some people that don't. Really? Some people grew up I with special editions. I don't anyone who thinks <laughs> that Greedo should have shot first. Like, really? Well, that, that argument, I think there's people that are willing just to accept it because they, aren't worth, they don't think it's worth arguing about, and then there's the people that will argue it till the cows come home. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so a couple more questions. This one um, comes from a listener, and he wants to know, why didn't Admiral, Admiral Monty sue Darth Vader for harassment in the workplace? It's all in the uniform. You know, we're fascists. You know, you know do you think they had health and safety and uh, <laughs> during the Third Reich? <laughs> it's just, you know, it's not going to happen. you got to man up. You know, man up and take it. It's the Empire, baby. Another question from a fan is, According to Wikipedia, you're working on a film called Monty Now. I wrote, Is there anything you can say about that? I wrote a fan film called Monty Now. Uh, and it went through certain variations of, uh, I guess Wiki, Wikipedia should be updated a bit. It was a, uh, it was a fan film, which was going to be filmed, and then through certain problems with money and uh, an idiot producer... Uh, it wasn't filmed, and the whole thing began to take up too much of my real time, being a real, now I work as a screenwriter now, so it, I, I kind of just dropped it. Uh, then I was looking to get it animated, because I thought that would be the easiest way to go. Uh, and again, I talked to a bunch of animators, and again, you know, you talk to people and say, oh yeah, I'd love to animate your film, you know. I would just do it in, just do it in Machinima or something, you know, anything. Just get it done. But nobody got it done there. And I, you know, I, I work in other areas, so I couldn't really drive it home. So it's languishing. So my, my new idea now is that I'm going to probably do it as an internet comic book. And just get, and I'm talking, I'm talking, talk to an artist, and hopefully he's going to start doing some panels for me. In fact, I've got to chase him. So, like, what it, what would this film be about? You said it's a fan film. It's obviously about Monty, but is it, like, comedic? Is it about what he did after the Death Star blew up on the Death Star? Admiral, Admiral Monty escapes the Death Star. And uh, he, he gathers around him a group of, you know, rebel deserters and dipsomaniac Wookiees and Imperial deserters. Uh, and he's holed up on a tropical planet. And uh, Darth Vader sends Captain Piet to terminate his command with extreme prejudice. 
So it's not so much a fan film, it's more of a send-up of Apocalypse Now. Well, that's really cool. I hope you actually get be able to get it done because uh, it sounds fascinating. It could be fun. It could be fun. It's just a pity. We, we were actually going to film it down in Georgia. Guy was putting up the money. Um, and it's a very funny story of why it didn't happen. Um, this guy was a, a member of the 501st, and he was a big fan. He was at Dragon Con every year. And I knew him from doing, he used, we used to go to quite a few conventions, and he had a huge collection of Star Wars stuff. And, uh, you know, two or three costumes, but like top of the line, he's like a lot of money. Uh, he's a big guy in insurance and investment down in Georgia. And then while we were setting up this movie, he, you know, he flew me into Atlanta from London, and we were casting, and we had done some... Uh, we done some uh, location searches, and we found a couple of locations, and we were figuring out how to build a boat to make it look imperial. So it was really moving forward. I had a young producer who came in to work on it with me, and uh, then it turns out the guy just disappeared on us, and we found out later that his wife didn't know that he was a Star Wars fan. Uh, he had kept all of his collection and his costumes in a garage, in a, in a storage unit. And she found it and uh, left him. So in order to get his wife back, he had to disavow himself of Star Wars. So <laughs> That's terrible. I know, I know, it's hilarious. I know, it's almost a film in itself. You know, <laughs> so... Uh, so that was years ago. My God, that must have been about, well, I've been doing cons now for 12 years. So I guess that's probably eight, nine, nine years ago this happened. So it was just, you know, and it, yeah, so anyway, there we go. So hopefully uh, I'm going to chase up the artist this weekend when I get back from Spain, next week when I get back from Spain and have him start doing some panels. Uh, and we'll try and get it up and try and get it done. I mean, now it's so easy. You could, you know, you know, you can actually do the comic and, you know, very quickly now, really. So it's just a matter of getting somebody getting down to draw. So recently, Disney bought Lucasfilm and with it announced more Star Wars films. And who knows how many Star Wars films? Probably at least three. So what are your thoughts about the new Star Wars? Star Wars coming back to theaters? The new writers, and what are your thoughts of Star Wars being back? Well, there should only be three more films. That'll be the last. That'll be the last three chapters of the Journey of the Wills that George wrote. So he wrote nine. But I do know there has been talk. Like Mark Hamill did talk about uh, how sometime George talked to him about a possibility of twelve. But I know there should be at least oh, well, three. Oh well, I know he wrote nine. So maybe there would be twelve. I don't know. I, if they're, if now that they're going to, how are they going to, you know, who's going to play, who's going to play uh, our heroes, you know? I mean, the only person you could pull back without a problem is, uh, is Chewbacca. Uh, <laughs> I think they're going to have to recast or uh, heavily, heavily digitize, you know, because they want to follow on, it's going to be chronological now. It should be, anyway, because that's, that's the story that George told us. So I don't know what they're going to do. It's going to be an interesting thing. I, I you know, they, they're in talks with Matthew Vaughn, I'm told, to direct them, I hear. Yeah, that's, that's some rumors. I know we have the writers for them, but yeah, Matthew Vaughn is one of the, the rumor directors yeah. and so on. I would hope Tarantino would do one. I think that would be hilarious. Uh, I think it would be hilarious, but it wouldn't fit Star Wars. Well, I don't know. You never know. With Tarantino, I'd, I'd be kind of scared. It'd be like M. Night Shyamalan doing a Star Wars film. You don't know what you're going to get. I want to let him. I think, I think, I think they've taken M. Night's card away from him. Hopefully, he's not going to be doing any more feature films. <laughs> well, he has a film with Will Smith coming out next year, so that might be yeah, really. Uh. Yeah, it's written by the guy who did uh, Book of Eli and uh, Saving Private Ryan, and then starring Will and Jaden Smith. It's a sci-fi one. Oh, what the kid. Will Smith and his son. Are oh, no. Him. Oh, really? Oh, God. That, that, boy, I look forward to that. No. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but as far as new Star Wars goes, um, we just know, we know the writer for the first one is Michael Arndt. Yeah. He's Toy Story 3 and Little Miss Sunshine. A good writer. Eh? And, you know, and I think, you know, really, quite frankly, my favorite script, and I think everybody's, 
his empire, and that was Lawrence Kasdan. And they have talked to Kasdan and the guy who did Sherlock Holmes and X Men First Class to write eight and nine. Really? Well, yeah, that's what Deadline's been reporting that Kasdan has been talked to about to write eight, and the guy who wrote First Class to write nine. Oh, that would be interesting because First Class was good. I really enjoyed First Class. Yeah, that would be interesting. Somebody, yeah, I just keep people keep asking me these like. Somebody wanted to do an article about, um, well, shouldn't Disney use the 20th Century Fox fanfare? <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, no, that's 20th Century Fox. It's a long story. <laughs> I don't have anything, you know, it's, it's a non-story. I don't want to give you a quote about a non-story, you know. Uh, so, yeah, so I think that's kind of, kind of the extreme some people are going to with this whole thing. Uh, I think the main thing that you got to look forward to with Disney is not so much that Disney now owns Star Wars as, you know, I mean, you see all these things on Facebook. Uh, I think the best thing you can realize is that uh, the helm has been taken by Kathleen Kennedy. Uh, and that's the business end of the Star Wars franchise that she's going to be producing. And there's none better. She, there's no one better to produce than her. So you, you mentioned how George did talk about nine films. Is there anything you can actually talk about or remember when he was talking about those where, to hint about where these films might be going? No. Since I don't think they'll follow exactly what he said, but any idea where they might be going? No, no. He just told me that, you know, he just roughed out. He, he gave me the breakdown of what, how the story worked from episode one through to where we were. And he said, that, well, then there'll be you know, if if we're lucky, we'll do we'll do another one. Uh, no, I, I mean, if he did, uh, he, he didn't. There wasn't a lot of sitting around chatting. Uh, George isn't that type of person. He's uh, he's uh, he, he's very internalized. He's kind of well. Imagine I always thought he's got the film running in his forehead. You know, he he just and he always said that. You know, he casts well. He more or less let us get on with it, quite frankly. Uh, so, no, we didn't, there wasn't a lot of chit chat with George. He, he's not, he's not, not, he wasn't a loquacious guy. Okay. So, that looks like to be the fan, that's, that's the end of the fan questions. So, why don't you, so fans can actually follow you and follow your work. Why don't you tell the fans what you've been up to recently, what you're doing now, and how they can uh, follow your work and or get in contact with you? Well, through my, through my Facebook fan page, Richard Laparmonte Admiral Mahdi, uh, it, it's, I'm, I work as a screenwriter, uh, which is what I have been doing for quite a while, for the last nearly 20 years. Um, I've just finished rewriting two of core two old projects, which I brought back for resubmission, which I'm putting out in the next few days. Um, I do a fair amount of conventions. I did quite a few this year because I, uh, because of the gentle giant bust that was done. So that kind of, I was spending a lot of time in the States. So I did quite a few conventions this year, which I really enjoyed. So hopefully I'll, I'll do some more next year. Uh, I've been having, uh, I do enjoy them. I enjoy the, you know, I still have an actor's ego. And if you work as a writer and you're in a room, in an office, looking at a screen, it's nice to get out and, uh, and meet fans. Because as I said, you know, like I said, I'm still an actor at art. Um, so I do enjoy them. Okay, and we'll send as many fans your way as, as we can. Um, one thing that I like to do on, since I run two podcasts, one I run Bombay Radio and I run Retro Star Wars, uh, one thing that we like to do for Bombay Radio listeners is we like to give the guests at the very end a chance to be on the soapbox. This is your chance to either promote a current project, um, promote like a current cause, or just say anything you want to say to the fans uh, without us saying anything to you about it. Is there anything you'd like to say to the fans? Well, well, I think, you know, in my little Thanksgiving message um, was, you know, this is a, a great club to be in. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy that I turned down Star Wars and was given a really good part to play. It, it was just amazing. Um, and I had one of the coolest honors this year is that uh, the scene was voted the 
30th most famous movie moment of all time. So I thought that was a pretty good honor. Even, even it, you know, Luke, I am your father didn't make the top 50. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> so, um, and as I say, I just, I, I do love the fans. I have a great time with them. And as I say, I'm really privileged to be in such a great club. Sometimes it lets us do things that, um, you know, we can have a little bit of an effect on things. I was contacted by a charity uh, for some communities on the Jersey Shore who were doing a, a charity auction in January. Uh, and Dave Prowse and myself and Jeremy Bullock, we were able to send photographs and some articles to be auctioned, which will, you know, which will go to raising money for, for that cause. We did the same thing a few years ago for the fires in, in, in Australia. So it is always good to be able to do something like that. So that's always a really a good thing to do. And I have somebody calling me, which I'm gonna hold it. So um, that's it really, that's me. Uh, I live part of the year in Bath, part of the year in the United States. I'm trying to spend more time in the States. Uh, I would say that uh, I'm hopefully going to be doing some theater next year as going back, going back to work as an actor. I'm supposed to be doing a film uh, in the new year. And well, that's, well, that's pretty cool. We hope to see you around here and we hope to see you at more conventions. And uh, thank you for answering all our questions, even some of the ones that, well, you gave us excellent answers and excellent behind the scenes and uh, lots of stuff we didn't know about. Well, great. Well, I really enjoyed it. I it is really good. And thank you very much. And uh, we'll make sure we send this to you as soon as it's up. It might. This is for the December episode, so it probably won't be for a couple weeks, as so we can film, put everything together. Sure, sure. But we'll send it to you right away. And you've been an excellent guest. Good luck with your future endeavors, and uh, thank you for talking to us. Thanks, the fans love much. it, and yeah. we like your work. Thank you. And have a good day. You too. Thank you.